everybody. It's Super Bowl Saturday, Ronnie. It's Super Bowl. Ronnie, you see my shirt? It says America's team, but I'm not. Is, we got to get a new. Um, America's team. And I and look, Ronnie, look at look at my star. Right. My star. And, and look, Ronnie, and I wore this just for you. I, got, I can't keep it on because it messed up my hair because I need the cuteness. I need to be cuteness overload. But I just what did thought, I what did I tell you? What did I tell you before the show started? I what care. did I tell you, Cowboys I fans? I don't care, Ronnie. I don't care because everybody, Buster regardless B. of whether or not their team is the Eagles or the Chiefs or not, is going to have their stuff. I don't care. Cluster B. I, Cluster B. Whatever, Ronnie. Hey, y'all. I am. Oh. Sports family therapist, licensed marriage and family therapist, Dr. Lauren Pitts. This house called pregame. Y'all know who that hater is. That's my hater. That's my resident terrorist. That's my disrespectful surrogate son. My co-host extraordinaire. He did all them things. All them things. But it is Super Bowl Saturday. Yes, yes, yes. One more day. You know, Super Bowl is kind of a um, a bittersweet day, you know. It, it marks the end of a, a chapter in the sports calendar where, you know, after tomorrow, there's no more football. Well, now let me take that back. No, because it's the S F USFL, the Rock. So the, right? the USFL and the XFL, which mm-hmm. um, I'm actually working on being able to um, have somebody from the XFL, you know, join us and talk to us. Going and it um, about their about their upcoming season and everything because the XFL is back for the first time in I think like 20 years or something like that. Nice. So that will be interesting to see. Um but yeah you know the Super Bowl is always kind of a bittersweet time you know I'm excited for tomorrow's game. I think we have a really great matchup. I did see where apparently um and your husband will probably like this. Um I wonder what Vegas the, is gonna do. How do you how do you wage your when Vegas is saying it's 50 50, like how do you how do you not get your legs broke tomorrow night? <laughs> well, speaking of Vegas, I will say this much. Um, there's a reason a lot of these casinos are popping up all over the country. Cause if there's one thing Vegas is gonna do, Vegas is gonna make sure they um they know how this game is gonna go. Um, so if they say it's gonna be close, it's probably gonna be close. Um You think it's gonna be a high scoring game? Um you know what? So I do. Um, and I'll share my score at the end. Um, and I'll also give reason and why at the end, why, who I think is going to win the game. Um, so we'll definitely get into that towards the end. But I do think it's going to be high scoring. You know, they said tomorrow there's going to be about $13 billion bet on this game tomorrow. Wow. $13 billion. That's a lot of loot. Just give me 1.3 million and I'm good to go. I need what? a little bit more than that. I need a little bit more than that. But I'm nah, gonna, nah, I'm nah, gonna, nah, I'm no, good. I do because I got, you know, I gotta go see a man about a dog. I gotta go see a man about a horse. I feel you. I got I feel you. Know, you. I got I, I you. got these across and I got some things that I need to take care of and so the first thing I would do, I would immediately pay off every penny of debt I have. Save a little bit. There's good debt. There is, but None, none of the debt I have. <laughs> <laughs> Our financial advisor at church last Sunday told us that student loan debt falls in the category of good debt. I said, work. <laughs> Look, hey, I'm good like a mug. <laughs> All the I, don't know. Debt I, got. I was like, who knowed? <laughs> you said that was the, the financial advisor at the church? <laughs> don't say nothing slick by my friend. You're so ignorant. You have to be ignorant all the time. Don't mm. make Jesus I wonder how many times I wonder how many times that plate get passed around during the service. I mm. bet we all do that. Cut it out. They're like, look, drop your card. We tap your card in the plate too. Our plate got the little chip. You tap it in here, everything. I am not entertaining your <laughs> look, shenanigans. God, food. God accept God accept currency in all forms, crypto, I'm not real paper. Entertaining all. your foolishness. You're crazy. What's up, man? Oh, you know what? Guess what, y'all? Guess what? Ronnie is going to be joining the Grown Ups Club on Tuesday. Monday. Tuesday, Tuesday Monday, Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday. Monday. That's right, because tomorrow's the 11th. 
So Monday, Ronnie's going to be 30. Yay! Ronnie, 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 Ronnie. Another, another bittersweet occasion. You know, it's crazy. I always tell people, like, for me, every birthday is important. You know, like, mm-hmm. obviously, there are milestone birthdays and stuff like that, 18, 21, 30, mm-hmm. 40, everything, so on and so forth. But mm-hmm. truly and honestly, every birthday is important to me because it's another it's another year around the sun yes you know it's another it's another chapter it's another chance to create more memories and more experiences Mm -hmm. and have a chance to reflect back on you know previous experiences and things and Mm -hmm. you know as I get ready to you know close out my 20s and whatnot you know I've really been you know just reflecting on you know just the the ride has been you know the last 10 years um Mm -hmm. I want to give you a lot. nugget of wisdom around that. Uh, two mm-hmm. nuggets. The first is, at some point in time, I'm going to give you 30 tips on how to make sure you reach 40. <laughs> I'm going to give you 30 tips on how to make sure you reach 40. I like but, that. <laughs> but on a serious <laughs> note, I, this is what I want to say, and, and it has a clinical spin to it. Ronnie, if you live to see 31, that mm-hmm. means that you will have lived another, I want to say it's like 565,300 minutes or something like that is in a 365 mm-hmm. day year. This is what I want to say to you, sir. I want you to embrace what we call the blueprinting concept. I want you mm-hmm. to be deliberate and intentional in creating a blueprint for your next. Because if you don't, what will happen is you will get to 31 and you will look back and 2023 will look just like 2022, 2021, 2020, 2019, and what have you. You have to take charge. And you know, people say, if you want to make God laugh, tell him what your plan is. But it also says in the word of God in Habakkuk 2 to write the vision and make it plain. But though it tarry, wait for it, for it will surely come. And that's my word of wisdom to you for your birthday. I might have a present for you. We'll see come Monday. We'll see. But dollar, dollar sign Hafrican 79 for those out there listening. H A L F R I C A M 79. That part right there. But I do. I want you to commit to creating a blueprint for your next and not just any blueprint. I want you to look at the primary domains of your life, your health and well being, your love and relationships your academic and career aspirations and accomplishments, how you spend your time and with whom you spend your time and the big one that everybody likes to focus on, your financial freedom. I want you to be intentional in creating a blueprint for your next so that when you look back at 2023 by far, it has been one of the best years of your life. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you for the words of wisdom. And I definitely need to see these 30 30 tips on how to see 40. I need, I need, I need to see if any of those um, might be real useful in this first year of my uh, this new decade. But I really appreciate that. It's crazy. Like, I was like, man, I'm really about to be thirty. Like, I remember like fourteen, fifteen. Like, man, thirty is like forever away. Away. Think it's old, right? <laughs> it's not that old, but Mm-mm. you know, I'm excited. It's a new, it's a new chapter. Yeah. It's a new opportunity to yeah. you know learn more about myself and you know really yeah. you know just. Hey, you know, um, these are my prime years. So, you know, Indeed. so, you know, I'm going to enjoy it. Enjoy these last few hours of being in my 20s. Um, you know, have my retirement ceremony, you know, early Monday morning. <laughs> you know, I, I was born at 4 I, I, I think I was born at 4.32 in the morning. So, you know, I was, uh, yeah, I popped up out here early. You know, I just should have waited Came one more day. I should have just waited one more day. That's it. One more day. No, because then you would have been robbed. I'm. I mean, in theory, I'm. In theory, like, oh, I'm Valentine's now. Day. You ain't getting a Valentine's gift and a birthday gift. <laughs> I shoot. I mean, I still get robbed now. I, I get to celebrate my birthday for about twelve to sixteen hours, and then you know, just because the the chivalry in me, you know, I have to get ready, you know, for Valentine's Day. So, you know, it's kind of like a now. If I was a female. Is, is, it works out perfect because my birthday and then the next day is Valentine's Day. So, you know, but, you know, my wife takes care of me on my birthday and Valentine's Day. So I, I appreciate that. But um, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm super excited for that. Super excited. Shout out to all my Aquariuses out there. You know, 
we're the greatest sign on earth. It's not even close. You know, we get along with everybody. You know, even though we get a bad rap out there, we, we they hard on us, especially us February Aquariuses. We stick together. All right, we stick together. Mm -hmm. We ride together. We die together. Mm, you know, bad boys for bad life. Sign, <laughs> bad sign for life. <laughs> so I can't with you, man. man. So, like we said, it's Super Bowl weekend. Yes, and with it being Super Bowl weekend, uh, Dr. Pitts, you know, we have to highlight <clears throat> some of our uh, HBCU alumni who are actually yeah, yeah. Um, partaking in the Super Bowl this year. Um, so, as my computer stops being uh, really, really slow, um, let's get into these. Uh, oh, what's going on here? What, why, why are you being slow? Why are you being all right? So we got four NFL players who play the HBCUs that yes. are playing in the Super Bowl this year. All right. So our first one is Javon Hargrave, a South Carolina State graduate, plays mm -hmm. defensive tackle for the uh, Philadelphia Eagles. He mm -hmm. got his bachelor's degree in sports management in 2016 and was initially drafted to the Pittsburgh Steelers that same year. Um, he was the uh, defensive player of the year and MEAC defensive player of the year in 2016 as well. So shout out to him. Mm -hmm. Um Franklin McCain III, known as Mac McCain, is a North Carolina A&T graduate currently playing cornerback for the Philadelphia Eagles. Okay. Um, he's actually the grandson of Franklin McCain, one of the one of the Greensboro Four, a group of young black men who inspired widespread civil rights action in the South after they did, after they were denied service at a Woolsworth five and dime lunch counter. Wow! Um, now that's a name I haven't heard in years. War. We had them all over South Jersey back in the day. Five and dime. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, wow. they had count the the little. They were the lunch counters. <clears throat> they used to go in and you know you could shop and whatnot, but they were the back part of the store. It was lunch counters, just like you see in a lot of the civil rights movies and stuff that we weren't allowed to sit at, and but that we would do the sit-ins at. That's mm -hmm. what the Woolworths were. They were they were lunch counter shopping restaurant luncheon net type things word okay word yeah we ain't have we have waffle house is the closest i get to that okay you know what well i was born in the 60s so that's why i'm aware, very much aware of what they are you crazy you so in other words you know what the kids say nowadays you were, you were, you were born in the mid 1900s you know <laughs> that's still just a big one they just put me back with the, with the, the with colonization. <laughs> hey, like look, a, hey, I had a kid I'm tell me, "Oh, you was born in you was born in the late 1900s." I almost smacked the kid. I was like, "Bro, I don't say nothing like that." Late 1900s, <laughs> so yo, <angry>. like what? <laughs> Anyways, let me stop being a fool today. Um, <laughs> our next one is Brian Cook, a former Howard University student who um who earned third team All American honors as a safety. Um, in the uh, college football playoffs. Um, and then last but not least, uh oh, wait, 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 where we go? Oh, yeah, last but not least, we have Josh Williams, who plays cornerback for the Kansas City Chiefs. Mm -hmm. um, he's actually a graduate of Fayetteville State University. Mm -hmm. He is the first Fayetteville State player ever invited to the college football senior bowl and the first player from Fayetteville um, State yeah. to be drafted to the NFL yeah. since 1976. Nice. Um, and if people remember, he actually was the one who made the interception against the uh, Bengals in the AFC title game nice. um, a couple weeks ago. So shout out to all four of those men who are representing their HBCUs in the um, Super Bowl this weekend. Super excited to have that. And Can I, I as piggyback he... on that too? Go ahead. I don't know if you were going to say it or not. If you do, if you were, I oh no, go ahead. You can go ahead. But you you remember, and again, you would have been much younger I don't think you would have still been a kid but when the Super Bowl used to be the last Sunday in January I think that it's pretty mm. cool that when since they've adjusted the schedule that the Super Bowl falls in February which of course is you know we know that's the 28 days that they give us to celebrate Black History Month but the fact that we have for the first time in NFL history two Black quarterbacks in the Super Bowl in Black History Month is it's history it's history so regardless of what team wins we win <laughs> And that's huge. And also, I think um, it's the first time since uh, we had um, Lovey Smith and Tony Dungy, where mm -hmm. it was the two black head coaches, uh, you know, yeah. first time in the Super Bowl. So I think, you know, that's monumental. Yeah, um, is. Now, you know, uh, I will say, though, you know, um, Patrick Mahomes is, you know, biracial. So, you know, y'all going to stop taking you only get half. 
too. You only get half. A, you only get half a pack. So y'all can only say Pat. Y'all can't say Patrick. Y'all gotta say Pat. You know, because look, we we matter too. All right, we matter too. Can't with you, man. So simple. So simple. Oh. But um. So yeah. So um. Outside of that, um. I wanted to share with you. So um. You know the. I don't know if you heard, but um. The Florida quarterback who had the NIL deal to sign to Florida, who mm-hmm. ended up actually having it um, rescinded and everything. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm is he the one you mentioned last week or a couple of weeks ago? You said something about had the crazy NIL deal. Yeah, yeah you he said was getting about so, it a week or so ago. So he was committing to um, Florida as a quarterback, but um, they were going to give him a thirteen million dollar NIL deal over four years. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm trying to find the uh, the picture that had the breakdown because the breakdown was crazy. Disrespect, Dude, Ronnie. Why are you doing that? You said you didn't you didn't watch NFL Honors on Thursday, but it was hilarious when Deion Sanders came up to present an award and he smooth made a plug for Colorado. <laughs> hey, hey! So, if there's one thing he's if there's I'm one like, thing yeah, he right. do, look, he was like, "Y'all heard me right." <laughs> If there's one thing he he's like, send them all to Colorado. It's definitely um, plug plug his school in. He's a master marketer. Mm-hmm. He is a master marketer. Man, where is it at? Um, so basically, what happened was, so the quarterback was originally committed to Miami, mm-hmm. and so he committed to Miami in the summertime. Fall comes around, he has a really good season, and so. Um, Florida was like, hey, you know, we'll offer you a scholarship on top of this NIL deal. So the NIL deal was for 13 million. Mm-hmm. So the way it was is when he's if he were assigned to uh, commit to Florida, he got 500,000 up front. Mm-hmm. 500,000 up front. As a freshman, his freshman year, I want to say it was 250,000 a month. Sophomore year was $325,000 a month. Mm-hmm. Junior year was like three hundred and seventy five thousand a month, and mm-hmm. if he were to come back for his senior year, it would be one hundred and ninety five thousand a month, which totaled out to like thirteen point something million dollars. Mm-hmm. Once he signed to uh, commit to Florida, the collective fell through; they didn't have the money, and so he withdrew from the school, and now he's committed to Arizona State, mm-hmm. but. Thirteen million dollars for a college quarterback to commit to a school is, I mean, that is crazy money. So I was listening to somebody talk about it and they raised the question. Do you think players will leave school early? Or cash out in college where you get four years to basically do, you know, be a a bigger kid? Mm -hmm. And, you know, college is for some people the best time of their life. And you're not all kids, but if you're that level of a prospect, you could possibly net 5, 10, 15 million as a college kid before you go to the pros. That's money you have right then and there. So what do you think about that? Do you think do you think kids might, you know, second guess leaving or leaving school early to collect that money if that's money that's available for them? I do. Um to their detriment. Um, when you think about some of the leading prospects in this country are children of color, many of which who come from uh, socio, you know, low socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, and with that low socioeconomic status, oftentimes I would, I think it's fair to go as far to say more times than not, there's a significant lack of financial literacy. And if they don't have someone in their corner that can appropriately advise them on how to manage wealth, not only do I think they'll leave early, but I also think that just like we hear with the NFL players, many are broke within five years, they'll be broke. They'll be broke and they won't have been positioned to go into the NFL draft Um, or whatever sport it is that they play. And I think that in a lot of ways, it's a recipe for disaster. You know, certainly we know that there are some benefits to the NIL agreement, um, but that has to come with financial literacy. 
if right. if no one is taking the time to educate and empower these children let's keep that real biologically they're adults but emotionally in so many instances they're children you know too much power can kill you it it's oh yeah in my mind, situations like that would be the equivalent of giving a five-year-old keys to a Corvette. You, you know what I mean? Um, mm. You, it is, it is a recipe for disaster if the appropriate measures are not put in place <clears throat> to support not only the athlete but the athlete's family in going in so many instances from poverty to that magnitude of wealth. And if we're honest, let's keep it real. You know, some of the the company, if you will, that comes along with that. You know, you have that one kid, he's the kid that makes it, right? right. But too often times we hear the horror stories, Ronnie, of you know, when they when they do the interviews or whatever, and it's it, it I'll give you a prime example. Um, that show that I that I uh text you about last weekend, Life After on Netflix mm -hmm. about the 12 NFL athletes. Um, one of the athletes, and I don't, it doesn't even matter which one it was, but one of the athletes, um, one of the individuals that they interviewed talking about the athlete's journey, when they first showed the, the gentleman speaking on camera, he had a drink in his hand. And the mm -hmm. more the interview went on, it was apparent to me that he was very heavily intoxicated. He wasn't the most well-spoken individual. And one of the things that was stated is, you know, he made it. It's like he made it for the whole community. And so many of these athletes, Ronnie, come from, and th their words, they come from nothing. So when you come from nothing at 18, 19, 20 years old, and you come into that type of money, what does that look like, Ronnie? What does that look like? Yeah, you, I am convinced beyond the shadow of a doubt that some of these athletes are going to be pressured by their families. And I'm sorry for giving the long-winded answer, but this, you know the stuff that oh, really yeah, no, my you... feathers. I believe that some of these athletes are going to be pressured by family members. I believe some folk, you know, the, the oldest trick in the book still happens. Uh, folk going to come up pregnant and all types of stuff is going to happen that's going to alter the life of this athlete in more ways than just financial. And I just think that it's, I think it's a train wreck waiting to happen in so many cases. And I think we're going to hear about it. I agree. I, I think, you know, <clears throat> there should be, and, and I would hope these schools are putting some type of, you know, financial literacy resources in place for these kids yeah. because, yeah. you know, kids are, kids are impressionable. Kids are very mm -hmm. impulsive, you know, and you give somebody that amount of money and stuff like that. Yeah, they're, you know, mm -hmm. if they're not, you know, doesn't they don't have the uh, financial literacy necessary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they'll probably make some, you know, not so good decisions. Right. Um, the one thing I will say is, though, I hope there are I hope the regulations that do come in place don't handicap the players, because right. I, I do believe that, you know, um, these players deserve this money, you know, like there should be a way that all these athletes should, you know, earn some type of income. Um, but I'm not gonna knock these players for making the income because we know how much money these schools make off the kids back anyways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, whether or not the kid makes it to the pros, whether or not the kid continues to play football after he's, you mm -hmm. know, exhausted his eligibility at the school, whatever mm -hmm. the case may be, we know the school gonna get their money one way or another. Yeah. And so we know Is these coaches business? gonna get this is business. Right. And we know these coaches are going to get their money one way or another. So I'm not mad at the kids getting the money. Um, and I think, you know, coupling the NIL with the transfer portal and how crazy that's been, because, mm -hmm. you know, now kids, you know, some kids are just transferring schools because, well, I can make this money this year at this school. Mm -hmm. And then I can make this money next year at that school if I'm good enough, you know, X, Y, mm -hmm. and Z. So I think it is really, and I think, I think we're going to start seeing a, a, a shift over the next several years, you know, with mm -hmm. USC and UCLA leaving the Pac-12, going to the Big Ten, mm -hmm. Texas and Oklahoma leaving the Big 12 this year, going to the mm -hmm. SEC. They're mm -hmm. expanding the playoffs next year to 12 teams and everything. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be a lot of changes and a lot of things moving mm -hmm. on. So a lot of these schools are going to have the opportunity to literally, you know, reach into their alumni resources and their booster resources and say, hey, mm -hmm. we'll cut you this check for X amount of years if you come do this. And mm -hmm. We'll see how it goes, but 
man, 13 million for a college kid, like. I want to, I want to plug that now based on what we were talking about before the show, because it's connected to the NIL, right? Mm -hmm. So my husband um, shared with Ronnie and I earlier in the week, this powerful, powerful story about a high school student named Malachi Coleman. Um, you want to say Wisconsin? Was, Wisconsin? I think so, yeah. I think he was in Wisconsin or Nebraska, one of those states up there. Um, and this young man was in the foster care system, African-American young man um, in the foster care system, just an extraordinary, extraordinary athlete. And he already has um, a lucrative NIL deal on the table. And just a little bit of backdrop about his story. Um, father not involved in he and his siblings' life. Mother, a you know, a very very serious drug addict. And when he was little, mind you, he's only a senior in high school now. When he was little, um, his mom took mm -hmm. he and his siblings to a stranger's house, a complete stranger's house, and just left them. And the next day he and his siblings were in the foster care system. Ronnie, he, as you recall in the article that we listened to um, the, the news report, this young man is donating 100% of his NIL money to the foster care system in that state because of the hardship and everything that that he went through being in the foster care system. Now, since that time, they've been adopted by a Caucasian family there. So life has changed for him, you know, by leaps and bounds and, and he's doing so much better now. But what do we know to be true? You know, the foster care system is, is trauma. Um, right. it, it, it fractures attachment. It comes with it a wealth of psychological issues that children have to deal with well into adulthood if it's not properly treated, but certainly it's something that you never forget. But for this young man to have such a philanthropist heart at 17, 18 years of age is extraordinary to me. It's right. extraordinary, but it also speaks to the, the influence that he has in his life now and how he's being nurtured and guided and directed to not be defined by the adverse circumstances that he was exposed mm -hmm. to growing up in the foster care system prior to being adopted by this family that didn't care that he was a black kid. It's like, we love children, we want children, we want them and, and adopted them and, and have given them a much greater opportunity and a better quality of life. So hats off to, to Malachi Coleman. Um, also just wanted to take a minute to, to all the haters out there, Ronnie, my quarterback was named the Walter Payton Man of the Year. Dak mm. Prescott is the Walter Payton Man of the Year. So congratulations to Dakota for that. And then, you know, I'm a big old crybaby. I'm a big old crybaby. So when they announced that he won, I cried. And I had told Eric, I was like, I hope he gets it this year because he was nominated last year too and didn't get it. Um, so I cried. But when I really boohoo cried, I mean, boohoo, I cried and cried and cried and cried and cried was when DeMar Hamlin walked out on the stage, Ron. Mm -hmm. He walked out on that stage and I I literally screamed out loud. <laughs> I was like, ah, he's there. I was, <laughs> it just blessed my heart. It blessed my heart. It blessed my heart. It blessed my heart. Um, to see, and it, and his his speech was so powerful because what he talked about was how he had one plan as it related to his athletic career and the things that he wanted to get accomplished as far as his contributions to the community at large, but clearly God had another plan. To want to raise $2,500 to get some toys, to raise over 9 million, mm. <laughs> That's that's what we call a floodgate blessing, Ronnie. That's the exceedingly abundantly above all you can ask or think blessing according to the power that works in you. It, it's God is just showing up and showing out in such extraordinary ways in this young man's life. And hats off to the NFL for having the foresight to bring his entire medical team from Buffalo and Cincinnati 
out on the stage and to publicly honor them for everything that they did to save his life. And I love the, the highlight film that they showed for emergency personnel around the league and, mm -hmm. and the contribution that they, it was just amazing. It was absolutely Word, that's the, I ain't gonna lie, you know, these charities, uh, you know, um, I tell these players, y'all need to be careful with these charities because Russell mm -hmm. Wilson have made it hot for y'all. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you I don't know if you saw that article that came out a couple of days ago where um, they uh, did the numbers and apparently for every dollar that Russell Wilson's charity has accumulated, only 24 cent has actually gone towards charitable efforts. The other the other money has gone to paying employed well paying people a part of you know the charity uh, organize, organizers and stuff like that. Um, which, you know, I mean, Russell Wilson is regarded as a very, you know, charitable and honorable person and whatnot. So, um, yeah, I always tell people, you know, like, hey, when you when you get a lot of money donated to we, we've seen it time and time again, when you get a lot of money donated to you for a specific cause, um, you know, money is traceable. So yeah. just be careful. You yeah. know, um, that was one of the things they said, Ronnie, is that that his efforts now go far beyond toys because he's now positioned to have such. Um, a significantly yeah. greater impact yeah. in the communities that he you wake up, you wake up to nine million dollars you you got a lot of options now <laughs> yeah yeah that's a, that's a whole lot more than toys that's that's a lot that's and, and a, a whole lot, lot more than his contract too yeah to you, habitat for humanity housing you know but i mean it's just it's just extraordinary it's extraordinary right. and he's so humble he's so incredibly humble it was just it was a it was beautiful to see um so yeah we're gonna get into this topic so i can share these stats real quick and then we can chop it up absolutely and i, I want to start our topic off by sharing a quote mm -hmm. and it's one of my favorite football i mean whether mm -hmm. it's football basketball sports life whatever this is one of my mm -hmm. favorite sports quotes but also doubles as a life quote mm -hmm. and i quote Winning is not a sometime thing. It's an all the time thing. Mm. You don't win once in a while. You don't do the right thing once in a while. You do them right all the time. Mm. Winning is a habit. Unfortunately, so is losing. Mm. Vince lose. Lombardi shared those words yeah. many, many years ago. Yeah. Um, and my dad used to make me read this quote when I was little. Mm -hmm. um and a couple other Vince Lombardi quotes um and I actually have a, a picture of this quote in my office at work mm -hmm. um hanging nice. up and because I think you know when we when we talk about coaches and everything you know the the important role mm -hmm. of a coach and stuff like that you know you can have a, a a roster full of talented players I mean just absolute you know just game changers and you can win a couple games you can you can win some you can, games you can win 12 games period. You can win 12 games off pure talent, you know. Two years in a row. But when it comes to coaching, if you don't have the coaches who put you in the right positions at the right time, understanding the scenario, understanding the environment around you and things like that, understanding mm -hmm. the, the the second by second play by play changes, right. all you have is a town is a roster full of talented people with no so, direction. That's right. And you know, we've seen so many times over the years in all the sports, you know, all these great coaches, mm -hmm. whether it's, you know, Nick Saban, Vince Lombardi, Bill Belichick, mm -hmm. um, Eddie Robinson from uh, Grambling State, mm -hmm. um, Co Coach Prime now at uh, from mm -hmm. Jackson State and now at Colorado, mm -hmm. um, Coach Harbaugh at Michigan, um, all these great coaches. And yeah. one of the things they all have in common is – this consistent and persistent urge for excellence. Yeah, yeah. Vince Lombardi has another quote. He says, perfection is not realistic, mm. but if we shoot for perfection, we can catch excellence. Mm. Good stuff. That's good stuff. And, so, and you know, so um, I, think, I think having, and, and another thing too, I also wanna talk about coaches real quick as well is you know not only how important it is to have a, a strong leader as a coach mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. also surrounding yourself with other people who have the same like-minded attitude as you your supporting and, cast 
would no matter whether you're the player because we look at we look at all the time with quarterbacks you can be a great quarterback but if you have a terrible supporting cast you're just an average quarterback same yeah. thing with coaches you can be a great coach individually but if you can't assemble a, a supporting cast that can help yeah. carry your mission and carry your objectives and carry your right. ideologies throughout the entire program and organization yeah. your program and organization will struggle you gotta have this this perfect fit like you you the puzzle pieces have to actually fit together you can't jam them together and if you don't have i believe it's a formula and we're going to talk about that in a minute right if if you don't have that formula it's like when i think about my husband and all of the other eagles fans that i know and, and interact with and i i hear i have heard their frustration over the years and one of the things i asked my husband <clears> this the <throat> other day i said how come for as extraordinary a coach as Andy Reid is, how come he didn't get a Super Bowl when he was with Philly? I'm just like, we know when they played the Patriots in Jacksonville and Donnie Choke, because I'm like, I really thought they were going to do it that year. Wanted them to win a Super Bowl with Donovan McNabb just because I like Donnie, even though I'm not an Eagles fan. But he said it, you know, we all the pieces wasn't there. You didn't mm -hmm. have all the pieces like Sirianni has now. And that makes a difference. You got a great coach and your team sucks. You got a great team and your coach sucks. Like you, it has to be a perfect storm that right. fits in order for it, the championship to be in your sights legitimately. Absolutely. And I think, you know, far too often we see where, you know, <clears throat> I think a lot of times, and we see that we see this more at the NFL level, um, but this happens at a lot of other, uh, you know, other divisions and levels too. Mm -hmm. You know, when we think about, you know, becoming a head coach and, you know, I always tell people like a head coach is more like a CEO than an actually like, you know, supervisor. And there's a, and there's a distinct difference. You know, mm -hmm. when you're the head coach, you are in charge of not only the entire football team, but the entire coaching staff, the mm -hmm. entire training staff, everything that is associated with your program, you, the buck stops at you. Mm -hmm. now, That's obviously, why you see coaches getting fired in the middle of the season for the NFL. <laughs> right. And, you know, now granted, you know, especially at the NFL level, you know, you have a general manager, you know, mm -hmm. all those other, all those other administrative positions. But yeah. as far as like the day-to-day -day operations of a football team, the head coach normally is the person who makes all the final decisions. Mm -hmm. And we've seen so many times where uh, a coach who is maybe a great defensive coordinator or offensive coordinator, where you only have to control one side of the ball. You only mm -hmm. have to manage a certain amount of people. It's no different than people who work in like the retail industry. You know, mm -hmm. in the retail industry, you might have, you know, you got your regular, uh, you know, store associates. Then mm -hmm. you got your uh, your team leaders. Then you got mm -hmm. your department heads. Then you got your assistant managers, managers, mm -hmm. so on and so forth, right? But if you take a team lead and make them the store manager, that's a that's a hell of a transition to where you know you're only running a specific department. You run in electronics. You know you run in mm -hmm. you know the day shift. Now you're running the entire store. You're in charge of payroll. You're in charge of PTO. Mm -hmm. You're in charge of you know hiring, firing, all those type of things that encompass being the CEO and the leader of a team and organization. Same thing with head coaches. And a lot of times when they get thrusted into that role, what we see is like yeah they can manage one side of the ball. We have to manage everything. And especially, you know, when you get to college and NFL, you're dealing with people who, you know, for example, let's say you are a college head coach. Well, now you're, you know, you're coaching 18, 19 year old boys who mm -hmm. you know, every now it's a different and then, animal. yeah, every now and then 18, 19 year old boys don't make the best decisions in the world. They do 18 so, and 19 year old boy stuff. <laughs> so now your phone's ringing at two, three in the morning because, you mm -hmm. know, the campus police is like, hey, um, we need Tommy you. Tommy is uh, drunk on the call. We, we need you to come down here and get one of your boys real quick, you know, mm -hmm. and that's those are the things that, you know, come with the territory. But, you know, what are, I'll, I'll, let's start with you. What are, what are some great qualities you think that a, a head coach must possess in order to be effective? Well, um, can I answer that in sure. 90 seconds? Because what I want to your point, that's how, I swear he reads my mind, y'all. We are so, so you were talking about coaches. So I wanted to point out some of the winningest coaches of all times. I'm going to start with college. So football, John Gagliardi coached at Carroll and St. John's, Joe Paterno, pedophile, um, Penn State, Eddie Robinson, Ramblin, Bobby Bowden, Sanford, West Virginia, Florida, and Florida State, Kevin Donnelly, 
um, Anderson, Georgetown, California, and St. Francis, Ken Sparks, Larry Kernis, Bear Bryant, um, Pop Warner, and Roy Kidd, or they're the top um, football coaches for college. Then you have basketball for college. Mike, is it Kurzuski? Him. Yeah. Um, Jim Bohe, okay. Jim Calhoun, Bob Huggins, Roy Williams, Bob Knight, Dean Smith, Adolph Rupp, Jim Fallon, and Cliff Ellis for men's basketball at the collegiate level. And then women, Tara Van Derver, whoever that is, um, Barbara Stevens, Vivian Stringer, Sylvia Hatchell, um, Jody Conrad. No Pat Summit? Oh, yes, Pat Summit. Pat Summit is on here. I'm sorry, got to be on there. Pat Summit for for Tennessee is on here. Um, And then for the NFL, it's where it gets really funky. Um, Don Shula still holds the record. Um, George Hallis, Bill Belichick, Tom Landry, Andy Reid, Curly Lambeau, Marty Schottenheimer, Chuck Knoll, Dan Reeves, Chuck Knox, Jim Fisher, Bill Parcells, um, Tom Coughlin, Mike Shanahan, Paul Brown, Mike Tomlin, Mike Holgram, Pete Carroll, Rant, Mike McCarthy, Joe Gibbs, Steve Owen, and then Sean Payton, Bill Cowell, John Harbaugh, and so on and so forth, and uh, Mark Levy, Tony Dungy. Um, can we shout out Mike Tomlin real quick? Um, we you know, can. In, in honor in honor of Black History Month. Yes. Um, Mike Tomlin is the only NFL head coach in NFL history to coach 15 plus seasons and never have a losing record. Yeah. He's a beast. He's had 16 straight winning seasons. So mm-hmm. shout out to Mike Tomlin for that because mm-hmm. for people who have played any sport, whether it's football or any other mm-hmm. sport, you know how hard it is to yeah. win a game. Yeah. And for him to never have a losing season, yeah. you know, black coaches in the NFL already, you know, got to be damn near yeah. perfect just to even yeah. get the job. And for him to maintain that level of excellence for 16 seasons in a yeah. city like Pittsburgh, where, you yeah. know, up until recently, they had the most championships in the NFL history. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the expectations and, you know, just the it's Super Bowl a bust every year mm-hmm. and for him to, you know, deliver year after year. Mm-hmm. Shout out to Mike Tomlin for that. And, you know, Virginia, uh, Virginia alum. Well, mm-hmm. well, William and Mary alum, but you know, he's from the 757 yeah, yeah. and everything. So um, yeah, shout out to Mike Tomlin. Yeah. So I think the answer to your question is I what I think they have in common and, and what research has shown me is first and foremost, Marlene, you gotta believe in your team. And that's you know, that has mm. been one of my biggest arguments, right? And it, mm. and it's stuff that I've called people out about. And I and and I'm going to separate it from the hate that people have from the Dallas Cowboys to just athletic logistics and psychology. Right. Mm. At the end of the day, as a coach, if you don't believe in your players, even the mm. worst players on your team, they mm. are not going to play for you. Coach said that when he came, when he was on from Virginia State and when last season, when uh, season before last, when we had the coach on from Morgan State and, and some of the other, even the players that we've had on that have talked to us about what encouraged them to play harder is they knew that their coach believed in them. When I think, and it always comes to mind when I think about the Detroit Lions who, you know, from a, um, a professional aspect, like we know they've had some really, 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 really rough seasons but they right. went out there every single solitary game and they played their hearts out. Why? Because they had a coach in the locker room that believed in them and believed in their ability to win even when they weren't. I think that that is one of the hallmarks of Prime. He has the ability, when you look at the documentaries that they've done on him, his speech is in the locker room man. he he goes in when he, they he, is, he has a way with words FAMU. remember when they played the ball game down in miami but they were playing famu down in mm-hmm. miami and they they were getting trashed initially <laughs> he kicked and he don't cuss he kicked their back in and i'm like oh i thought you wanted to be great y'all don't want to be great you just want to be mediocre and he like he just he got in here 
-hmm. He got in here because he believed in them, but somewhere there was this disconnect where they stopped believing in themselves. And you can see that. You can see in these games when the coach gets defeated. When the coach gets defeated, the team gets defeated. Because if you stop believing in your players, why should they believe in themselves? You're the leader. You're the HNIC. You're the, mm-hmm. you're the, you know, you're the captain of the ship. If you don't believe that they can do it, why would they? I, I think the other part of that is, and I think, I mean, we, I just feel like we see it more in the forefront where the NFL is concerned than we see it in the collegiate realm. Mm-hmm. Um, talking about Nick Saban or Bobby, you know, or, or some of those. Thank things. Nick. The, it's about results. I remember you said a couple seasons ago how literally after the national championship, Saban does not give his players a break. They get a couple of days. <laughs> I, I, I will never forget that. Back. Like, I think they were playing. I think it was the Notre Dame championship back in 2011 or 12. I can't remember. Mm-hmm. But literally the first thing they asked him was like, all right, coach, you know, another national championship, mm-hmm. you know. How long are you gonna celebrate? What's next? Oh, I'm gonna celebrate for about 24 hours, and That's then all the boys, we start we start winning workouts in two days. I was like, no break, when, none. When, when to, and for those who don't, for those who might not understand, well, what's what, what's winter workouts? Winter workouts are mm-hmm. like the winter workouts. You if you if you know you know winter workouts are not fun. Mm-hmm. It, it gets real. And mm-hmm. to just have won a national championship from the previous mm-hmm. season, and you were starting winter workouts two days later. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, y'all just won a national championship. Bump all that. Brand new season. That's mm-hmm. why I said this offseason, I feel bad for them Alabama players. I can yeah. only imagine how yeah. winter workouts are going right now. Just said knuckles oh is bleed. <laughs> I promise you. I bet they have the I bet they have the halftime show from this past year's national championship on repeat in a locker room yeah. oh my god they will never let coach yeah. Saban be embarrassed like that again on national <laughs> tv but yeah. you know but it just shows you that level of excellence like you have to i had a coach in high school and when he first said it i never understood it until you know i, I got a little bit older and i got to college he mm-hmm. used to always say i hate losing more than i love winning yeah and it- Go ahead. Go ahead. Finish your thought. No, no, no. Finish your thought, and then I'll circle back and tell me. There was one more thing that that I wanted to say, but I think it ties into what you're saying. Go ahead. And you know, so when when I when I first heard that, I was like, "What do you mean you hate losing more than you love winning?" You know, but mm-hmm. I always tell people now that I'm older, you know, you can you can learn a couple things in a win. You know, when you mm-hmm. win and stuff like that, it, mm-hmm. it kind of reaffirms that you know the game plan, the practice schedule, you know, everything mm-hmm. that we did for preparation, it paid off this week. Whether mm-hmm. it's a one-point win or a 20-point win, a win is mm-hmm. a win. It's hard mm-hmm. to win a game. But when you lose, mm-hmm. I always tell people, you know, when you lose, you can take it as a loss or you can look at it as a lesson. And I think what makes a coach really great is by being able to pull the lesson out of a loss mm-hmm. and help the players understand that, look, like we made a couple mistakes here and there. We did a few things, a few decisions, mm-hmm. a few moments of, of not mm-hmm. concentrating or not focusing that cost us the game. Mm-hmm. So these are the things that we need, really need to emphasize and make priority during the following week. So that way, if we find ourselves in that very same position again, we've been here before. We know if we do it this way, that's not mm-hmm. going to work. It's going to cost mm-hmm. us the game. We must do it differently. And I think it takes a coach to understand that you can beat kids up after they lose a game. You can do mm-hmm. that. Or you can take that opportunity to be like, look, we lost. Yeah. Above well, all else, I can't let you it. curse at you, all that, but we lost. So either mm-hmm. we can take these lessons from this loss and mm-hmm. learn from it, or I'm just going to continue to put y'all down and say, well, y'all need to figure it out for next week. Right. Ronnie, that I'm so glad that you brought that point up because on, you know, I'm addicted to ESPN. I watch ESPN all day, every day. But during one of the interviews on, I don't remember if it was Thursday or yesterday, but they were, and I do not remember his name. They were interviewing one of the players from the Vikings and he's verbatim. He said almost what you said verbatim. And he, they were talking about um, Stephen A. Smith had asked him about some of those games, that the, the couple of games that they came back from like way, way, way behind and won. And he said some of those close call games that we won, 
he said, we would have learned a greater lesson had we lost them. He said, mm -hmm. because there were like, he, he <clears throat> talked about how you can start to take stuff for granted and go yeah, into places, the next week cocky and overconfident. And it comes mm -hmm. back to bite you in the behind. And he said, I mean, verbatim, he said the games that we lost, there were lessons in that, that we need to know, like, are we a good football team? Yes, but we needed to be a great football team to do the things that we had aspired to do at the beginning of the season. And we just didn't do them. And we didn't do them because we didn't learn the lessons from the losses and from the games technically that we should have lost, but won mm -hmm. at the last minute because of you know whatever it was that went on. And what that speaks to, and what you were saying that, that reminds me of how important it is to have some heart, right? Mm -hmm. If there was, you know, people joking clown in the whole nine yards, clearly I don't like the 49ers. But Shanahan, the 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 heart that this dude has, he did not, and he, he's got swag anyway. I was with the swag around all the black people, but he got swag for days. But he, it's like he never slumps. He never, and like he, if there was ever a coach that had a reason to feel defeated and beat up and kicked around, but he didn't. He didn't. He represents to me he is one of the best examples of what it looks like feels like and means for a coach to have heart when all like it just it was a train wreck it just never stopped coming and because he's stone-faced all the time anyway it's like you you couldn't read him and even during the press conference when they asked him and he was like well obviously it didn't feel good but he wasn't going to show that. We're going to go out there. We're going right. to call these places. We're going to do what we need to do. We're going to try and get this win. It missed all of this adversity. And that's what it looks like. You know how much respect them players have for him and how he literally would be able to get them to do anything under the sun that he wants them to do for as long as he continues coaching because he he's full of fight. He, there is just absolutely positively no give up in him, win, lose, or draw. Those players know he got us. Mm -hmm. He got us. His, he's got a heart the, the size of freaking earth that is like, we going to. It also helps that he had a father who was successful at it too. Yeah. So he yeah. Was able to see it's in his DNA. Hand. Right. He was able to see firsthand like what it means to lead a group of men you yeah. know and I don't know if Kyle played football I don't know if he did or didn't mm -hmm. I think he did but yeah I think he did too you know I think I think what helps a lot of people and you know I, I'm not saying that you have to play football or you have to play basketball or anything mm -hmm. like that to be able to coach the game but one thing that it one thing that it does do for the players mm -hmm. is does let them know that okay he's speaking from some type of experience yeah. you know yeah. whether or not he's been in the NFL game and Mm -hmm. you know, game winning drive and stuff like that. He understands the magnitude of being in a situation where you got to go down the field and score. There's no ifs, ands, yeah. or buts about it. So, right. you know, that's important and that's invaluable because when, you, when your players know that what you're selling and what you're proposing to them mm -hmm. is authentic and real, they buy into it. Can I ask you a question, Ronnie? You, you said What's something up? and I want to talk about, I, wanna, I want you to, to speak more to the buy-in piece. You talked about when you lose a game and coaches come in the locker room and they scream, yell, and curse you out, but there's no discussion around the lessons. Clinically, my brain, and I know this is probably going to sound like a mom statement. I don't care. Um, I think that players need to feel a degree of safety and trust with their coaches. If I can't, and we've talked about this where mental health issues are concerned, right? As players, you need to have a, a level of trust that you can speak openly and honestly with your coach and not be beat up and kicked around. And because during y'all spend more time with the players and the coaches than you do with your own families. Mm -hmm. So if, if you don't have an emotionally safe space to be vulnerable and transparent with your coach, how does that affect your play? Are you going to give your all for a coach that 
did you feel like just assassinate you all the time? So I think my answer is probably gonna be a lot different than you know the the newer generation because mm-hmm. I I played in an era where you know you got a coach would call you a coach would call you everything but a blessed child of God and mm-hmm. if you wanted to say something back you could you mm-hmm. won't be a part of the team no more but you can definitely say yeah. something back if you wanted to but I will say this though in my experiences um, I will say that the coaches I had um, we never got we never got chewed out or cursed out during a loss. Mm -hmm. It was always when we won and it was when we won carelessly, like we had careless wins. Mm -hmm. Like I give you a great example Two, well, two examples. Well, I'll give you a a good example. So my junior year at state, we get Brandon, Coach Scott and everything. We play Kentucky state third game of the season Mm -hmm. and we blow them out, beat them 42, nothing. And Mm -hmm. I, and I think I shared this story before I'm here before beat them 42, nothing. I mean, just, won't game won't even close at all mm-hmm. the very next day on Sundays now Sundays we always had a lifting and then some type of light conditioning mm-hmm. on that Sunday the day after the game we ran I think like 23 200 meter sprints that were timed wow. each one of them were timed and we ran one for every penalty we got during the game now oh, mind wow. you our, our coach our coach got two of those penalties too and his ass ain't run but you know, <laughs> he got two of the penalties. <laughs> but the the point of that was, and he said it like, had you all done this, had this many penalties in a game against a team that was actually worth something, mm. you all would have got the doors blown off of you. And they were ticky tacky, yeah. like holding, false start, mm-hmm. offside, mm-hmm. like just just ticky tacky penalties. That, that when you're being careless, when you, you know, when you're not all the way locked in, they're just careless penalties, their lack of effort, their lack of focus, their lack of, you know, consistency mm-hmm. penalties and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And so his point was like, I'm not going to allow anything in a win that I wouldn't accept in a loss. Mm-hmm. So, you know, every time, every time we won it, when I was in college, my last two years, every time we won a game, I would be more afraid of the film sessions when we won than when we lost. Wow. Because when we won, oh, they were going, oh, they was going to pick us apart. Because mm-hmm. once again, the mindset was we won this game, but we could have lost it too. Based on X, Y, and Z. So what it taught us was it's like, A, never take a win for, for granted because they're mm-hmm. not easy. And mm-hmm. B, never get complacent. That reminds me of the movie Coach Carter, which folks know is based on a true story where they were they had beat the brakes off of one of the, the high school basketball teams they were playing and the next day in practice everybody was bragging about all the points and stuff they had this that and the other and coach the coach was played by samuel jackson he said now you had x number of free throws that you missed you missed x number of rebound he broke down and then he made them run so yep. he made them run and i think i think that's important because and, and like you said i mean coaches who beat their teams up after a loss i mean it's pointless. Like we lost. Yeah. Obviously, something didn't, wanna play yeah, obviously something didn't work. So yeah. it does me no good to continue to double down and beat you down and make you feel worse. Because once again, that's a quick way to lose trust in your team. Yeah, you yeah. know, like I think a lot of players understand, like, you know, coaches have to be, you know, a-holes to a certain extent. You know, mm-hmm. like it's a business. Like Russell. Like, yeah, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think players respect that when you, when you are consistent in how you approach the team, players mm-hmm. can respect that. Like we knew yeah. Coach Scott was going to be, if if all else fails, he was going to be an a hole. But he was an a hole who cared. Mm-hmm. Like he would jump through a window for us. But you had to get, you had to match his effort. You had to match his energy. Mm-hmm. And and we bought into that and we accepted it. Our mm-hmm. previous coach. Who, depending on who was around and depending on what was going on, he'd be a certain way, and then he'd do something else. He'd say yeah. something, and then do something else. And as a team, we were just like, "Yeah, bro, we really don't, you know." When you feeling you like that? Yeah, and we we didn't we didn't believe in his system, and as a result of that, we were four and six, and you know, yeah. we were terrible. But what that talks about to me, what you're saying is. The, and that's the, the other part, right, that I think that makes for a successful coach is the relationships have to be there. 
then right. if you don't have healthy relationships with your players, why would they play for you? If exactly. you're if your players don't have healthy relationships with each other, you know, we've seen that and everything that's going on in the NBA with the trades and Kyrie coming in to Dallas and Kevin Durant going to Phoenix and and the and and oh boy that it that is not earning his keep uh Alicia Keys and Russell Simmons son what's his name you know who I'm talking about he was with the Sixers now he's with the Nets what's that boy's oh, name oh Ben Simmons Ben yeah, Simmons oh yeah, yeah, yeah you know he is just not uh, yeah I, I can't not I, I getting her done you know? hey look I I mean you know I Everybody's mental health is different, you know. Um, right. So I hope and I believe that we we say it lightly, but I hope got some mental health stuff going on. For yeah. real, for real. On the, all the, NBA got, the NBA got man, the NBA season is about to be about to be interesting. How it finishes? Yeah, yeah. But um, it's crazy. So any any final words, thoughts, or anything before we get ready to wrap up? No, nah, wrap us up. I think we, you know, well, we, we just so let's up. do our Super Bowl okay. picture real quick before we wrap up because I gotta go. I gotta go get pretty before my birthday on everything. You know, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. I'll be talking to you on Monday. I appreciate you, but um, so I let you go first. Who do you have winning Super Bowl Fifty Seven? And I, I'm who assuming your husband's at work. Who do I want He's not to behind. I'm assuming your husband's at work, not around you, no gun pointed at you with a sign saying, you know who to say, don't play with no, me. No, so you, so I did it like this on purpose. So you see my lipstick is red. Okay, okay. More red lipstick. I, I see the nails. I see the nails are giving red too. No, they're burnt orange actually, but it's okay. okay. Um, That's my favorite color. So it is pretty. Um, so uh just because I'm diehard Dallas Cowboys, I can't root for the Eagles. <laughs> so, I, but no, on a serious tip. So I re- I love Andy Reid. I love, 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 love Andy Reid. Hence why when he was in Philly, if the Eagles weren't playing the Cowboys, I would root for the Eagles just because I liked Andy Reid. Um, but I will never be an Eagles fan. Um, I want the Kansas City Chiefs to win, but I don't think they're going to. I think okay. the Eagles are going to win. I think the Eagles are going to win, and I think Philadelphia is going to be insane and in all surrounding areas. And I'm so glad that we don't live there anymore because it's going to be 2023. If they win this Super Bowl, it's going to be insane. Okay. So, okay. I don't have a score because I just, I, I need, I don't know. I just, I think that it's going to be a really, really, really good game. But I, and both teams have their, their, their strengths. Um, I feel like Philly has less weaknesses than Kansas City does, and I think they're going to capitalize. And they, I just think they're going to bring it. I think they come in with a vengeance, and I, I, I believe they're going to win. Okay, so interesting pick. So, um, I'm going with Kansas City. Okay. Um, my score, I'm going to say the score is going to be 35-31, Kansas City. Okay. Here's why I say that. Now, everybody, all I've heard for the last two weeks since, you know, both teams won the game is, oh, the Eagles going to run the score up on them. They're going to run, That's run, not gonna run. Happen. They're going to keep the ball <laughs> from them and everything. So I want to highlight a couple of things here, right? There's mm-hmm. two things to keep in mind here. Number one. They both have a mutual opponent that they played this year, mm-hmm. the San Francisco 49ers, mm-hmm. right? Now, we saw what happened when the Eagles played them. We know the situation where, you know, the quarterback went down X, Y, and Z. Mm-hmm. Now, Kansas City played this very same San Francisco team back in October. And actually, before the Eagles game, that was the last time 49ers had lost a game was to the Chiefs. Mm-hmm. Now, here are some interesting things. So, number one. Patrick Mahomes threw for over 400 yards and three touchdowns against the 49ers. Now, the 49ers defense on that day had no injuries, had no significant starters missing time. So that was that full-blown, very good defense. He wasn't hurt, though. Huh? He what? Patrick wasn't hurt. He wasn't, right. He wasn't hurt. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, 
diced up the 49ers defense, right? Passing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, when you all played the Eagles back on um, the first time, which was, no, I'm sorry, yeah, um, New Year, Christmas Eve. When you no, all won the second 40, time. When, the second time, yeah. When you all won 40 to 34. Here are some interesting things from that game. Dak Prescott threw for 347 and three touchdowns. Combined, the Cowboys had over 100 yards rushing, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't think that the Eagles' defense is going to stop the Chiefs' offense so easily. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, the Eagles' defense is really good. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. But they are susceptible to being beat, right? Mm -hmm. We've seen that. We've seen the Cow We've seen Dak Prescott go up and down the field on the Cow I mean, on the Eagles, mm -hmm. right? It was one of his better games during the season go up and down the field on them. Also, too, if Kansas City can have any semblance of a run game, mm -hmm. any semblance of a run game, they have a legit chance. I think whoever – I think it's going to come down to whoever controls the ball more, whoever wins the, the time, time of possession, possession you mean? and whoever has the least amount of turnovers has mm -hmm. the best chance of winning this game. Mm -hmm. Now, and with the know. Super Bowl, Ronnie, you obviously you so hypothetically, and I don't know, has a Super Bowl ever gone into overtime? Yeah, uh, just one, the one um, with New England and Atlanta. So they, so you got to play till you have a winner. So it's going to be interesting. Yeah, I got Kansas City winning. Um, I, I, you know. Whatever team wins, I think is you know if Jalen Hurts. Andy Reid gonna pull out the high school playbook, but Sirianni just came out of high school, so he's gonna be familiar with the high school right. playbook. I think it's I think I think it's gonna be a great offensive matchup. Like people, you know, granted, I don't I don't have that much faith in Kansas City's defense, but they're not a slouch. Like their yeah. front seven mm -hmm. is to be reckoned with. It's mm -hmm. their back end that you know. Now, granted. Both of their HBCU players are the DBs. So, mm -hmm. you know, that is something to be mindful of. So they will be targeted. They are rookies, and they got a hell of a task. They got Devontae Smith on one side, and they got mm -hmm. A.J. Brown on the other. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it is. But they just played Jamar Chase and T. Higgins. So it's not like this mm -hmm. is anything, mm -hmm. you know, new to them. So it's going to be really good. I'm excited. Yeah. I'm excited for I, the it, game. It is. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I'm more excited 30 years ago when my team was playing but um um over the years it's like okay it's super bowl and i, and I like to watch a super bowl but i'm actually excited for this game and i was excited in 2017 because i and that i'm telling you the only reason why i root for the eagles in 2017 is because they was playing the patriots because i hate the patriots i hate the patriots so it's like i need them to i feel them. you I need them to beat them. And that was just so, a good yeah. thing. Because I was like. Tell, tell, tell Eric, um, not, I'm not, no slights, but I do think it's going to be a close game. But mm -hmm. I do think Kansas City is going to come away 35-31. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be a, 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 a fireworks of a game. Yeah, it is. But yeah. And I Riri think, is doing the halftime show. So halftime is going to be lit too. I'm, in, I'm interested to see what she's going to do for her. It's been seven years since she put out an album. So, you know, Look, I'm interested like, to see. Um, some of the songs she might not be able to sing. Some of my favorites. <laughs> so, but yeah, that's all, that's all I have. That's all we have. Um, everybody enjoy Super Bowl weekend. Be around friends, family. Enjoy a couple, you know, brews and everything. Be safe if you out there in, in public at the bars and whatnot. Um, it's going to be a great time. It's going to be a great game, great halftime show. I'm super excited for it. So, yeah. So, um, with that being said, you all, oh, make sure you all, uh, like, and subscribe on YouTube. All right. You can catch all our episodes on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Make sure you please like, and subscribe because when you subscribe, that helps us out a lot. All right. Yeah. And, and let people know, tell a friend to tell a friend to tell a friend to like, and subscribe mm -hmm. to our channel on YouTube. It's house talk pregame under Dr. Lauren Pitts. You can find that on YouTube. Also, we're on Apple Podcasts as well. So make sure you uh, find us on Apple Podcasts. Uh, House QR Talk code is out there. Putting the QR yep. code out there. So you just click and listen, click and listen, right. click and listen. So, ma so make sure you uh, subscribe to that as well. And yeah, you know, support the, support the channel, support the podcast. Like we said, we're a grassroots podcast, you know, trying to have a voice for our athletes out there. So once again, thank you for joining in with us again. We'll check y'all out next week again. So that being said, have a great weekend and I'll holler at you. Go Chiefs!
Bye-bye, y'all.